backward through the ages, we can read on history's pages. Things that Jesus King has done. We are told of great commanders, Wellingtons and Alexanders, and the battles they have won. They have won. Take our own great revolution that began our evolution. War is in that one history. My parents, when I was about 10 years old, gave me the 16 volume History of America, my American Heritage series. And the volume that I liked the best was the one on World War I. I just found it fascinating. And then, you know, also as a kid, you know, reading Peanuts, and there's Snoopy looking after the Red Baron. And so, uh, and, and the Air Wars was the first thing to, to, to draw me in. And it really is fascinating. And it was the only part, part of the war that, that was really romanticized. And so I read novels about pilots and things like that and found it really interesting. But then I, as I got older, I got more interested in, in the ground war. And I, I was lucky enough as a kid to actually have met some guys who were World War I veterans. And they had some fascinating just stories. And, and to me, as a kid, all the, you know, my friends are playing you know, cowboy and Indian or they're playing World War II doing commandos or rap patrol, that sort of thing. I was interested in World War I. People were looking at me like I had three heads. But I just, I still find it fascinating. And it's, it's the most artistic war, the 20, uh, uh, probably of all time. Great music came out of the war. It, you know, jazz becomes an international music because of the war. It, you know, so great art, great literature, great music, and that's my fascination with it. The current wars we are in are the only wars in American history for, for two things didn't happen, where we didn't raise taxes and we didn't pay for it as we go. You know, World War I, we're going to pay as we go. And so we had war bond drives, we had war saving stamps, we did all, people could do, could do other things as well. If they couldn't afford, afford to buy a war bond, they could make bandages, they could save food, they could, you know, give, you know, barley, wheat, things like that that would go to, to relief for the soldiers. So we wanted everybody to be committed. Even if you're not in uniform, you have a service to pay for your country. So you have this sense of uber patriotism that takes place, but it was sincere. And people who did not abide by the line were called slackers. And, you know, and the way the term is used today, people don't understand the gravity of that term. If you're called a slacker, you're essentially being told that you're unpatriotic, that you're anti-American, not un-American, anti-American. And it's a World War I where we don't want to have hyphenated American. We want 100% Americanism. I'm not a German American. I'm not an Irish American. I'm not this, that. I'm an American. And it's, it's World War I where they start playing the national anthem at football games, at baseball games, before movies. The way I do it with my students is that we are completely surrounded by the remnants of World War I. I mean, you're clean shaven. You know, and, and people didn't go clean shaven for World War I. If you look at pictures, they've got these crazy beards and all this stuff, but you can't get a tight seal on a gas mask if you're not clean shaven. And so you probably used a safety razor. And the thing is, you know, think about using a cutthroat razor and an artillery piece goes off. <laughs> Well, the Camp Brothers of Ohio invented the safety razor in the 1870s. Nobody bought it. In 1903, they sold the copyright for their safety razor for $1 to King Gillette. And so we know Gillette today. You know, people wear t-shirts, jockey shorts, that's World War I. People you know, wear wristwatches instead of pocket watches, that's World War I. The insignia that soldiers wear in the field is cloth. That's World War I because they were using brass insignia. And so you've got your, your two collar discs here, they're, they're brass, and you can see right there the, the brass insignia. Well, if a light goes off and that's going to be reflected, all you got to do is, is aim in the center. And so we now have cloth insignia. And it goes on and on and on. And, and so people are affected by World War I on a daily basis that they don't even, even realize today. I wanted this part to be like going from the propaganda and all of the image and the posters Here. to the reality of what it would be like going down into um, a dugout. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. So this was originally the garage, and then it became room for my junk, and all the room under the house became room for my stuff. Um, but it's every one of these groups, and that's one of the big thrills I've had about collecting, um, the, uh, all these uniform groups are somebodies. All but about two or three of these uniform groups are identified to whose they were. My hobby, what I've done since I was nine years old, is 
collect military stuff. And in particular, I've about since 1982 collected World War I stuff, Doughboy stuff. And I, I love the olive drab, love the smell of mothballs. It's just, it's exciting to see one man's stuff spread out and displayed. And that's what these different items are, is one person's stuff. All of the rest of it that he brought home, just the way he brought it home, to save it for posterity to help tell their stories, what they saw and did just about exactly a hundred years ago now. <clears throat> this is one of my great groups. This is, I got this one uh, April of this year from a friend of mine that's just thinking about selling all of his stuff out. Um, he's 84, Bob Ford, famous collector in um, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. He got it from his friend who died suddenly, who got it right from the family. His, this fellow's name was McMurray. Aura McMurray um, shot down three German planes, the piece of the uh, aircraft insignia off the side of a SPAD 12. This is an article, see, about where that would have been on the airplane. They called themselves the Wolf Pack, 49th Aero Squadron. And see, the Germans are wearing the camo helmets still. Now, not all of them are, but some of these are camoed helmets, mm -hmm. and then the Americans, everything would have been just like that, and it'd be rare, these show Eagle Globe and Aethers on these hel uh, Marine Corps helmets, but theirs almost never had that on there during the war. So that was done post-war too, where they put the insignia on the front of the helmet. I had started off, when I was nine years old, hunting Civil War relics with a metal detector, going to every Civil War battlefield, been all interested in that, and then as I got a bit older, Civil War stuff was so expensive, it was getting faked to beat the band. And I thought, you know, I'd rather do something more modern. So I got a little bit interested in any World War II history. But then as I'd run across World War I stuff, um, what I loved about it, it was some of the Civil War period values, the family, the friends, the um, connectedness those um, guys ha were having going overseas in France in World War I but with modern weapons. So it was the value system and the, um, the real family focus from Civil War era meets World War II type weapons, gear, and equipment that suddenly on a worldwide scene, America entered the world as a world power. Spanish-American War it started, but it really took over in World War I that the Americans entered the scene, the national scene, became a world power. And it's been more and more world power really ever since. I had <clears throat> my grandfather, I've got his helmet that was made into a lamp of all things, so it's just a helmet shell, and a German pickle lobby brought home as a souvenir, and of all things, a hand grenade, Mark I so hand your grenade. Uh huh. My grandfather fought um, 54th Infantry, 6th Division, and they call him Sightseeing 6th. It was interesting. In World War I, there was a hierarchy among the veterans. The guys that got overseas ranked way above the guys that didn't get overseas. And if you got overseas, the combat units, regular army ranked over National Guard, ranked over National Army draftees. But by the latter part of the war, everybody was all mixed together anyway. But there was always still, I was there. I was over there in World War I. And uh, Granddaddy was, he lost all of the hair from his knees down um, with mustard gas exposure, and the hair never grew back. So he had advanced trench foot complications and then the mustard exposure from being exposed to gas in World War I. Well, when I was growing up, I still had my uh, elders refer to it as World's War One, the war to end all wars. And here we are now at that century mark uh, talking about the Armistice Day of 1918, which uh, I, I had relatives who, you know, that was very dear to them and they, they, they felt that was one of the most important days of their early life was the end of, of the Great War because many of them had relatives or husbands or uh, brothers and so here we are a hundred years from that day and uh, we still have a touch to it because we knew people who knew people they were all, they were from all walks of life and of course at that time Williamson County was a very rural county 
And so you, if you look at these guys, the role of those boys, they're all from out in the country and they were basically right off the farm, which uh, was, uh, they made good fighters. Uh, there were some town folks that you'll see in that list. I mean, we had Dr. Nolan, who was our, uh, a doctor here in town, uh, and, uh, Dr. Cliff, who uh, was, was, went off to war. And then, of course, we had the, probably the, the leader of it all was Captain Tom Henderson, who was a lawyer here and uh, was uh, uh, a captain of uh, Company D of the 114th Field Artillery in Tennessee. And these guys, uh, there were a few that got killed, and we, uh, uh, Reese Amos uh, lists those, and, and some that were wounded and uh, were really uh, crippled for the rest of their life. So, well, uh, we we had several black troops that uh, that did go, and mainly they, according to what they reported back, uh, they were the ones that uh, did a lot of the manual work of digging the trenches and uh, the typical things you'd think of of uh, taking care of the mules and horses because, you know, they were still, the cavalry was still in, in force uh, then. And then uh, driving trucks and uh, uh, helping in the, uh, 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 with the surgery and stuff like that, I mean, as nurses. We discovered that our chapter um, knitted scarves and caps and socks for the current, the troops mm -hmm. of the time and um, we also, our chapter also rolled bandages and to send over. There was a lot of victory gardens planted and um, ate from. The woman who started our, this particular chapter was in charge of the food stamps that was offered or the, um, the food rations for the ticket. And you went to the grocery store with your ticket to receive your food. But the Victory Gardens were really used for that because most of the food was encouraged to be shipped to Europe. I read on um, the Red Cross nurses, and I actually know another chapter of the DAR. They did a project on one of their Red Cross nurses that left Asheville, North Carolina to go to the front line in 1914, and she actually returned, and she was a nurse anesthetist. So the nurses, the Red Cross nurses that volunteered, they left long before the men were drafted and they were on the front line and as brutal as the war was they saw many many casualties and death and they had to address a lot of serious wounded and there was a company small company at the time from Wisconsin that had developed a product that was developed from wood pulp and cotton and the nurses it was the most absorbent bandage the nurses had ever used and they realized that it could be beneficial for their own hygiene. And so they took advantage of those bandages on the front line during the war. When the war was over, a group of those Red Cross nurses went back to Kimberly Clark and asked for that product to be developed for purchase. So Kimberly Clark went back to the U.S. Army, purchased the surplus that the Army, U.S. Army had took that product and developed Kotex. And two years later, they learned they could iron that product and developed Kleenex, 1919 and 1920. In my eyes, it changed life. It changed, it changed life. As I was speaking earlier to you, our whole Engl our, our, the way we communicate with each other changed because when the men came home, they had just served a year with 14 other countries men from 14 other countries. The way to communicate without learning other languages is they created slang. We use so much of that slang and we have no idea where it came from. And there are times I might want to throw out a slang word that I know the root of it mm -hmm. and I can't because um, of what it really represents, which I think is so interesting because now I'm in the habit mm -hmm. of Googling slang words, because I don't know that I necessarily want to use it because of its true origin. One third of the American population in 1917 is of German extraction. And the largest population of Germans in America is just up the road from us in Cincinnati. And so with that, 
our propaganda mill works overtime to, to, de, you know, to dehumanize Germans, everything German's bad. And so for example, it's no longer, you're not having sauerkraut, you're having victory cabbage. You know, it's not, it's not a dachshund, it's a victory dog. You know, it's not a frankfurter, it's a hot dog, that sort of thing. And so, because in, in Tennessee, we outlawed the teaching of German. Now, I don't know how much teaching of German was taking place in Tennessee in 1917, but we, we demonized everything German in some of those posters we just mentioned, you know, the, you know beat the Hun and the, and the Germans are depicted as absolutely savage and, and, and bestial. So it's a uh, propaganda really, really ramped up to get us involved. And then there were a whole series of movies that were made. And in almost all these movies, a couple of things happen. One is that the Kaiser is depicted as, as being just absolutely lecherous. And in a couple of these films, the Kaiser is depicted as, as, a, as a, essentially as a rapist. And so we have people, you know, that um, a variety of different actresses, like Mary Pickford, and it's got a couple of different films that she's in. Uh, we have the Germans preying upon them. So the Germans are not just evil, nasty people. They're also sexual predators, which I find really interesting. But it's a tough sell between April and, say, August of 1917. After August of 1917, more Tennesseans are going to become committed to it. And it's interesting that the first American wounded in World War I is actually a Tennessean, a guy from, from Fentress County, from Martha Washington. His name is George Ashburn. And he was on that first contingent of Americans. Only one contingent of Americans made it to Europe in 1917. It was the first Marine Division and a, a, a motley crew of, of different, of, of, of amalgam, amalgamated units. And George Ashburn was wounded on September 29th, 1917, a year before the guys in the, in the 30th Division, you know, do their thing. But uh, so it takes a while, but once, once George Ashburn's wounded and other things like that happen, then we're committed. You know, here's this guy from Tennessee who got wounded. He's, his name is being plastered across the news across the entire United States, if not the world. Now we, got to, now we have, literally have blood in the game. And so after, I would argue that after Ashburn's wounding, uh, we're, we're committed. These guys, like I said, they, they already knew each other. There was, there was a unit cohesion that you didn't have anywhere else. Uh, there's this book that I'm working on, um, the, the British, these guys fight under British command because when Pershing wants to keep the American Expeditionary Forces autonomous, and in order to do that, he has to give up divisions. So he gives up the 92nd and the 93rd, all black units, and there were some people from, uh, from Williamson County, black people who were in the 93rd, so, and they fight for the French. And those will be the most highly decorated units, in, uh, American units, the entire war. But then Pershing gives the 27th New York Silk Stocking Brigade and the 30th Division to the British. So it's fascinating. These guys, they have British uniforms, they've got British helmets, they've got British weapons, and, and the, the, the artillery using, pieces they're using are actually French. They're French 75 uh, millimeter long range artillery pieces, and then they have some British pieces. So they are fighting uh, in, in this war, and they're largely forgotten because they fought under British command. And what's a couple of, you know, the, the, probably the most important, you know, battle that they are involved in is one of the last of the war, the Battle of Montfaucon. And, you know, that, that's Falcon Mountain. And Montfaucon is about 30 miles from Verdun. It's about 10 miles from where York did his battle and it's really, really rugged terrain. Uh, one of the guys, like actually Cook Villian, who was there in the 114th, he was a spotter for the artillery. And he's trying to get his gas mask on his horse, because he, horses had to have gas masks too. And so at the, during the Battle of Montfaucon, he's trying to get the gas mask on the horse, and the horse bit the end of his thumb off. And then, it's a, then a German shell comes and just blows the horse all to pieces. And so these guys saw some really, really brutal, horrible stuff. But, like I say, the British, were, they, they considered these guys essentially a PALS unit. And a PALS unit in the British Army, these were folks that knew each other, that had things in common, that they had a long history with each other. And so, as a result, these guys are looking out for each other. And, and the 30th Division did not take nearly the same kind of casualty rates 
as some of the other American divisions did because th this is literally my friend from down the road. This is the person I work with or I went to school with this person. So I think that's one of the things that's really fascinating about these guys in the 114th is how, how much history they already had with each other and, the, and that continued after the wars as well. So uh, you know, African Americans in Williamson County and throughout the state, they, they wanted to prove their worth and they were hoping that if they fought, you know, in the, in the, if they served in the war, that they get some of their civil liberties back, that they would, like, like saying, get their right to vote. Very few African Americans, even though they technically had the right to vote, could not vote in Tennessee. Memphis is an exception. You know, uh, Boss Crump is making sure that the black community gets to vote in Shelby County. But in other parts of Tennessee, you know, African Americans are disenfranchised. So they're seeing the war as an opportunity to prove themselves to be good citizens and hopefully advance their cause and be accepted as equals. Were blacks drafted just like whites? Yes. Okay. And the thing is, most black units, you know, most blacks who are not in the 90s, in, in the 92nd or 93rd, they're given terrible jobs. Uh, they're, they're, there's this notion that they, they're not gonna be able to fight. So what they do, they, they're gonna serve as stevedores, but more, more importantly, um, it's their job to do battlefield cleanup. So they're the ones who are digging the graves. They're the ones who are, they would, in some cases, they would dig a, a body up three times. So a body would be buried in the field, they'd have grave registration, mark where it is, then they'd come back and get it. And then other folks say, well, look, we, want to, we want to send the bodies home, and they might, or they'd say, oh, we want it to be buried in the, in the cemetery. In the, the World War I cemetery in France is the largest American cemetery in, in, in Europe, and most people aren't aware of that. It's the Heights of Romagna, it's, the American, it's, it's near the York site. It's not far at all, it's not far from Montfaucon. It's closer to Montfaucon, it's maybe five miles from Montfaucon. And so, you know, so some of those black people end up digging these decaying bodies up two and three times. In the home front, um, everybody is in, involved in some way. Women's clubs, especially the, the local chapters of the Red Cross, uh, the, the um, I think it was called the Altrusa Society, they, were, they had those chapters all across the state of Tennessee, they made comfort kits. And so you, these women would come together. And what was interesting, uh, in, in some of the counties, it was, very, it, was, it was socially stratified so that you, you don't have upper class and, and lower class people mixing. Uh, Williamson County is different in that, that they had, it didn't matter where you are on the social structure, you can you can con contribute. So, with these comfort kits, you had people who were doing things like knitting socks, making mufflers, things like that. But then also you had the folks who were saying, okay, what kind of food stuff can we make that can travel? And, and there's not a lot of stuff that you can make that's going to go go the distance. But if you're making things like hard candy, that will work. Of course, you got to worry about vermin and stuff getting in there. But more importantly, a lot of these people, they're, they're writing letters of encouragement. And that was so important because mail call was the thing that soldiers really looked forward to. They would literally have lists and say, and, and a lot of times it was the local newspapers doing this, yeah, these are our boys in uniform. And you know, would you write a letter to this person? So they would assign these folks. Churches were very, very important in this and making sure that members of their congregation where they got in touch with them and you know, some of the churches would send little devotional pamphlets and things of that nature. But the, during the, and, and, and this people were essentially coerced, the, the food drives during World War I, they, they were overseen by um, Harcourt Morgan. Harcourt Morgan was the Dean of Agriculture at UT and then went on to become the President of UT went on to be one of the first three heads of TVA. They set quotas for each county for what, you know, if we need this much wheat, we need this much, you know, barley, we need this much, whatever. And, and so you were really pressured to do that. And so they were also canning societies. And so they get these women are coming together and they're canning beans, they're canning tomatoes, all this stuff, essentially for the war effort. Those would actually go to, the, to government collection points and a lot of this stuff is not gonna end up in the hands of soldiery thing, and a lot of it's just busy work to make you feel like you're involved in some way. I think too about World War I, 
it was still the origin of the civil rights movement. So many of the black American soldiers that were fighting with the French and were treated as full human beings, but not just combat soldiers. Every black soldier was treated as just an American soldier. So even labor battalions, they treated them like just another American soldier. I think it was the origin of the civil rights movement. That's not widely known. I think that the tactics and the capability, supply, logistics, army movements that the American army was cultivating in World War I bore fruit all the way through World War II. In other words, we became a world power largely on the World War I stage before World War II ever took place. And they knew that if we could do that, what we did in World War I, we could do it even to a much greater scale in World War II, and they did. And then the 82nd Division, one neat story that illustrates, though, that Americanization of that immigrant population. <clears throat> they had leave trains, tremendous percentage of 82nd Division, which was the one Alvin York was in, a tremendous percentage of them were Italians. And those Italian vets, they made up leave trains. There was a, nearly 5,000 Italian soldiers that were fighting in the American army that they took on leave trains to go see the family while they were still in Europe. They took them all to Italy. Afterward, they were there about um, four weeks. They got all of them put back together to get back on the train. And so they had figured a certain number of those American soldiers would want to stay there with the family in Italy. Or a lot of them would go AWOL and just disappear between there and coming back to France and coming back with the Americans. Not one of those soldiers from all of those leave trains stayed in Italy. Every single one of them got back on the train as an American soldier to go back to America. And you can't think of many places in the entire world where that would be the case, you know? And so I think that the World War I for the Americans was a great mixing bowl for immigrant populations that had never ever been incorporated on a scale like that into the American fabric. They shared experience and they were all veterans together. World War I, as I tell my students, without World War I, there's no World War II. It, there's not, you know, and, and we get that little intermission. But, you know, in, in Europe, World War I is essentially seen, it's, the, you know, the, World War I and World War II are basically seen as a continuation of the same conflict, and they are. So that's one really, really obvious thing. Without World War I, there's no Cold War because that Versailles Treaty demonized, you know, the, 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 the Soviets. And the Soviets, they're tearing each other up. They're in their own little civil war. Yeah, you know, between the white Russians and the red Russians, and, and we actually send troops, you know, to, to interfere in the Russian Revolution, you know, the so-called you know Siberian Exposition, and there were several Tennesseans who end up in Siberia, you know, during that Russian, you know, revolution, revolution, that, that civil war, and perhaps most importantly for us right now, without World War One, there's no Middle East, and so you know, that's why World War One is important. We don't ever want to make those kind of mistakes again, and we need to figure out how we can correct, and I think we can correct some of those mistakes that were made, but it's going to take a lot of work.